Last time I finished talking up, talking about the um, uh, processing of proteins. And um, I described to you how chaperonins uh, are important for helping proteins to fold properly. And I said it wasn't uh, something that every protein needed, but that it was very uh, beneficial for the folding of some proteins. On the other side of the protein equation, we think about breakdown of proteins. Cells have turnover of proteins. And that turnover of proteins performs several functions. We won't talk much about those um, here at this point. We will talk about them later with respect to uh, the control of gene expression. Uh, but suffice it to say that cells don't want to have all proteins floating around forever. They want to have a way of dealing with damaged proteins. Some proteins, they just simply want to get out of the way. And to be able to do that, cells have a structure called a proteasome. And that's the structure that you see at the top of that figure. Proteasomes are involved in breaking down proteins into smaller units. Typically, they break uh, them down into uh, smaller peptides of about eight amino acids or less. And that's what was referred to in the song where it talked about units of less than nine. All right, That's what the song was talking about. And the song also talked about something that was important for the um, proteasome to be able to recognize which proteins should be broken down by it. And that's ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is a small peptide that is attached to proteins, serving as a signal that this protein should be broken down by the proteasome. Okay? This scheme shows the way in which ubiquitin is actually added uh, to proteins. We see uh, a complex of three proteins called E1, E2, and E3 um, that are involved in putting the um, ubiquitin onto a target protein. So we can see in the first step, for example, the, um, of the ubiquitination uh, that there is a, um, uh, what do I want to say, uh, addition of the ubiquitin to um, uh, the E1 unit. Uh, that reaction requires ATP. The second step in the process, the um, ubiquitin is transferred to the protein E2. And E2 uh, is targeted for protein E3. So we sort of see a step-by-step -step, uh, process happening here. The substrate that you see in E3 at the bottom is the target protein. And that target protein um, is where the ubiquitin is added. This, is, this process is called ubiquitination. So that ubiquitin that was on E2 gets transferred onto the substrate protein uh, located on E3. You also see uh, at the very end that that substrate protein can gain multiple ubiquitins. That's the UB part of that overall process. And multiple ubiquitination is a, a very good flag that this is a protein that the cell wants to get rid of, and the proteasome will grab it and break it down. Uh, this shows the structure of uh, ubiquitin. Um, don't really have much more to say about that. Um, and the last things I want to say about proteins are a protein structure, uh, at least as, re as regards tertiary structure, is that there are some other considerations for protein structure. One is a, an important class of proteins that people are increasingly uh, focusing on. They're called intrinsically disordered proteins, or IDPs. So when I show you a protein structure, you think, OK, well, that's the structure of that protein. And one of the things I hope you keep in mind is that protein structure is somewhat fluid. So nothing is exactly the way that we see it, that there's some movement and some fluidity associated with that, those proteins. We'll see that today with um, hemoglobin. But some proteins have a lot of fluidity associated with them, meaning they have really no fixed structure. And that fluidity is a part of their function. So if I have a protein over here that has a relatively fixed, uh, func uh, relatively fixed structure, and it interacts with this other protein over here that doesn't have a relatively fixed structure. What can happen is this fixed structure can induce a fixed structure in the one that doesn't have the fixed structure by its interactions. So it's converting it from something that's fairly fluid into something that's fairly fixed. And now that protein that didn't have that fixed structure gains the fixed structure from binding to the other protein. And when it gains that fixed structure, it may now gain a new function. So the ability of this protein over here, this fluid one, to be able to change from a fluid structure with no function to a bound structure 
with a fixed structure and a fixed function means that intrinsically dis disor disordered proteins provide yet another means of control of protein activity. So intrinsically disordered proteins, as I say, important class of proteins that we're recognizing now, and that's one important consideration in terms of the control of their activity. There are many functions they may have. I note that some are involved in signaling, some are involved in regulation. Some of these may also be involved in other uh, activities like catalysis and so forth. The last category of protein structure for tertiary structure relates to metamorphic proteins. And this is a much smaller class of proteins, but we're again increasingly discovering uh, that they have some important functions as well. These are proteins that may have two different fixed structures. It may flip between one and another. So one example I gave you was lymphotactin, which uh, functions as a monomeric receptor. However, when it binds to heparin, and we'll see heparin's involved in the um, preventing a blood clotting process, it binds as a dimer. So lymphotactin is able to flip between a structure as a monomer and a structure as a dimer. So a protein with such a function or such ability uh, would be referred to as a metamorphic protein. Okay. So, so far I've talked now about primary structure, the sequence of amino acids. I've talked about secondary structure and supersecondary structure, which were repeating structures like helices and strands and sheets that arose from interaction between amino acids that were close in primary structure. I've talked about tertiary structure, which relates to uh, the folded structures that arise from interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary structure, and it's the folding that actually brings them into close proximity. And I think, yes, that's the end of that. Okay, so the metabolic melody there is the one we had last time. We'll stop that one and move on to the next. Any questions before I uh, move on? Questions? Yeah. So, okay, so I'm coming to getting this question. So I'm talking about these things in class. You're seeing a lot of things in the book. What level of detail? And I actually covered that in the first lecture, and that is the level of detail I expect is anything I talk about in class is fair game. So my lectures should be the guidelines for your studying. The highlights are hopefully helping you to see those um, uh, uh, points that I'm making in lecture better. Okay? Yes? Are chaperones only present for initial protein folding, meaning when the protein is first made? Yeah, the, it's a good question. It turns out chaperones actually function in some cases to help proteins that have gotten slightly misfolded. So um, I mentioned last time about how cells can experience heat shock. And in heat shock, what's happening is uh, a cell is exposed to a slightly higher temperature than normal. And for some proteins, that can be uh, enough to sort of flip them out of their regular structure. When that happens, the uh, chaperonins may be, uh, their synthesis may be induced, okay? That is that they're induced by the heat shock, and we frequently see in, in almost all types of cells that these are also called heat shock proteins because they get made when heat shock occurs. So if you think about it, the cell is now making something, a chaperonin, that will facilitate the refolding uh, of misfolded proteins. That help? Yeah, back there. Can't hear you, sorry. How do we initially get prions? Yeah, yeah, good question. Everybody would like to know the answer to that. <laughs> if I had the answer for that, I think we, uh, we would be uh, uh, happier. Uh, we don't completely know how that, uh, that process gets initiated. We know it's a misfolding, uh, but we, what is it that caused that initial misfolding? I, I think at this point it's anybody's guess. Yeah. Unfortunately. Okay. Well, today I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and I think it ends up being one of my students' favorite subjects, and that's hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is going to amaze you in terms of the number of things that hemoglobin can and does do. Hemoglobin, of course, we know uh, is essential for the movement of oxygen within the body, and it's essential for animal life. 
animals have very widely varying needs for oxygen. We need oxygen at a different level sitting down here than we do out running on the track, different than we do when we're sleeping, etc. And we have places deep in our body where we need to get oxygen that uh, hemoglobin delivers to. The demand for oxygen can change, as they say, in seconds. If the fire alarm went off in here, we would immediately jump up, get out of here, and our need for oxygen would be satisfied by the fact that hemoglobin is able to deliver widely varying needs of oxygen. Now, one of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't completely take care of our oxygen needs. We'll see that, particularly under, air, under times of very high um, uh, physical exercise. But it's pretty darn good at delivering what we need. Plants don't have hemoglobin. They don't have widely varying needs for oxygen. A plant sits there, right? A plant typically doesn't have very deep tissues that need to have that oxygen. And that oxygen is important because, as we will see, our cells are much more efficient at producing biological energy in the presence of oxygen than they are in the absence. ATP energy is produced 15 times more efficiently in the presence of oxygen than it is in the absence of oxygen. I'll come back to that theme many times during this term. Respiration refers to the oxygen uh, using processes that, we're out, that, that we are all engaged in here. Fermentation refers to uh, conditions where there are low oxygen conditions and uh, the body still needs to be alive or the cells still need to be alive under those conditions. And it may surprise you, but your body does fermentation, and we'll talk about that later in the term. It's important, therefore, that the body efficiently move, carry, deliver oxygen as it's needed, satisfying all those divergent needs that we have, as I've described to you. Well, let's start talking about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin uh, is a protein that has four subunits. It's the first protein we've talked about that has multiple subunits. Multiple subunits. Two of the subunits are identical and called alpha. The other two subunits are identical and are called beta. Each subunit contains one group called a heme that I'll show you. And each heme binds one molecular oxygen, O2. The four units, as we will see, are arranged in what I call a donut hole. And that little thing in the middle is a donut hole. So the arrows point to first, the four different subunits, and no, you don't need to know which one is alpha and which one is beta. The alpha and beta subunits are very, very similar to each other, and so we won't distinguish them in this class. The donut hole is right there in the middle. A related protein is called myoglobin. Myoglobin is also an oxygen binding protein. It's much better at binding oxygen than it is at delivering it. Instead of having four subunits, myoglobin has one subunit. And myoglobin is closely related to both the alpha and the beta subunits. They have uh, evolutionary relationships. Now, the fact that hemoglobin exists as four subunits and myoglobin exists as one has a very important effect on the way that hemoglobin acts and binds oxygen. Myoglobin doesn't have that. Well, a protein that has multiple subunits, and those subunits are interacting, we call that yet another level of structure of a protein. That's called quaternary structure. Hemoglobin has quaternary structure because it has multiple subunits interacting with each other. Myoglobin does not have quaternary structure because it only has one subunit. If you look within each of those units, whether it's the myoglobin or it's the hemoglobin, and by the way, myoglobin also has one heme, and each heme in myoglobin binds one oxygen. You can see those little ball-like structures in the case of the hemoglobin on the left, or a little red ball structure in the myoglobin on the right. That's where the heme is located. And the little red balls are indicating the presence of an atom of iron. That atom of iron is located in the center of the group we call heme. Now, you'll notice that heme is not an amino acid. Heme is a planar structure, meaning it's flat. And it's what we also refer to as a prosthetic group. And a prosthetic group is a group that helps a protein to perform its function. It's a non-amino acid. So a prosthetic group is a non-amino acid that helps a protein to perform its function. 
You can see on the right the schematic representation of hemoglobin looking a little different than before, but again, showing you that each, each subunit contains one heme group, and that that heme contains an iron in the middle. That iron is the part of the heme that carries the oxygen. We'll see that's critical. Ferrous iron is the iron plus two form, and it's the only form that will carry oxygen. If we oxidize that iron in the heme, we create an iron plus three, and that's known as met hemoglobin, and that will not carry oxygen. That's pretty amazing to think of, that that iron is carrying oxygen, but it doesn't get oxidized. Because if it gets oxidized, it will no longer function. Pretty cool balancing act the body does with that. Okay. Let's take a look at that heme instead of looking at it flat. I mean, I'm sorry, looking at it at face on, we're going to look at it flat. So the figure that you see on the screen is that heme looking very flat. So we're looking at it from the side. The iron is in the center. And we see that that iron is attached to the side chain of a histidine. That histidine is part of the protein that's holding the um, uh, heme group. So now we had alpha subunits and we had beta subunits. Those are known as alpha globins or beta globins. So globin is the protein part of hemoglobin. And histidine is part of that globin protein, whether it's alpha globin or, or beta globin. Did you have a question? The heme gets added after the protein structure is formed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, what you see on the screen is a depiction of what's called deoxyhemoglobin. This hemoglobin has not yet bound to oxygen. Okay? It has not yet bound to oxygen. Remember that that histidine is, bound to the re is attached to the rest of the globin protein. When we add oxygen, something magical happens. I like that word magical. Okay? Something magical happens. It's an extremely minor thing. If we weren't so picky about biochemists looking at this, you would overlook it. What happens is oxygen comes in. Oxygen is uh, O2, or those green ball structures that you see there. When they bind to iron, they actually lift the iron up very slightly. It's a very, very nanoscopic, picoscopic movement, very, very tiny amount of change. But that amount of change has some enormous effects on hemoglobin, absolutely enormous effects. I pull on the iron, I lift it up. If the iron is attached to the histidine, the histidine will also be lifted up. And since the histidine is attached to the rest of the globin, the rest of the globin will have its shape changed very slightly. What you see happening here is what happens in the lungs when hemoglobin arrives there. When hemoglobin arrives in the lungs, it has no oxygen on it because it's dumped it off at the tissues. An empty uh, iron gets, it's bound by the oxygen, and oxygen lifts that hemoglobin. I'm sorry, lifts the, lifts the histidine that's attached to the globin. Yeah. It's Monday morning, isn't it? Monday afternoon. Everybody with me on the movement? This has happened in one subunit. It turns out that when hemoglobin gets to the lungs, this may surprise you, it doesn't want to bind oxygen. It's in a form we call the T state. Hemoglobin gets to the lungs, it doesn't want to bind to oxygen, it's in the T state. The form that wants to bind oxygen is called the R state. T state is really good at letting go of oxygen, R state is really good at holding on and grabbing a hold of oxygen. Well, why does it grab oxygen at all? The answer is, in the lungs, the oxygen concentration is very high. Oxygen literally is forcing itself onto hemoglobin. And thank goodness it does. Because hemoglobin has to get loaded up with oxygen in that very quick passage through the lungs. Let's look at how that process occurs. Okay. On the left, I've depicted hemoglobin as it arrives at the lungs. I depict four squares, and those four squares each have no oxygen. And on arrival in the lungs, oxygen forces itself on, and we can see that oxygen has 
forced itself onto the lower left subunit there. And you see that change in structure that I described to you earlier. Iron got pulled up, histidine got pulled up, and that chuck, chuck, structure changed from a square to a circle, schematically showing you how it's going from the T state to the R state. Okay? Oxygen has been bound. Now look what's happened to the two subunits that it's attaching. The two subunits that that subunit is attaching have stopped being square structures and they become more rounded. Why has that happened? Because the small change in the structure of the first subunit is communicated to the other two. They have changed from being not wanting to bind oxygen to, hey buddy, come on over here, let's bind some oxygen. What will happen then is that they will be much more likely to bind oxygen. And oxygen binding is favored. So the binding of the first one favors the binding of the second one, the binding of the second one favors the binding of the third one, and the binding of the third one favors the binding of the fourth one. What I've just described to you is a phenomenon known as cooperativity. It's really good for loading up hemoglobin as it's passing through the lungs. Binding of the first one favors the binding of the second, favors the binding of the third, and favors the binding of the fourth. By the time this process is done, hemoglobin is loaded with oxygen. Now hemoglobin, or cooperativity I should say, cooperativity is a phenomenon where the binding of one molecule favors the binding of additional molecules of the same type. We see it happening in hemoglobin. At that point, hemoglobin exits the lungs and goes out into the tissues where it can deliver that oxygen. And that's a very cool process. Okay? And we're going to talk about the delivery of oxygen in just a second. But before I do that, I want to contrast the binding of oxygen by hemoglobin with that of myoglobin. This is a plot that shows on the y-axis the percent saturation. What percentage of the protein in there is full of oxygen? The x-axis shows the pressure in millimeters of mercury of oxygen. And when we compare the binding curves of myoglobin versus hemoglobin, we see that myoglobin binds a lot of oxygen at very low oxygen concentrations. That's a really cool thing, an important thing, for a protein to do if it's an oxygen binding protein. Low oxygen concentration, it loads up. Hemoglobin doesn't load up. Is that bad? That's good. Why is it good? Well, let's think about it. In our lungs, what's the oxygen concentration? High. In our, deep in our body, in our tissues, what's the oxygen concentration? Low, right? High oxygen concentration, what percentage of hemoglobin is bound with oxygen? Earth. Hello, Earth. Hello, NASA. I'm calling from the moon. Anybody awake down there? Repeat the question. At high oxygen concentration, what percentage of hemoglobin is bound with oxygen? 100%. Isn't that where you want it to bind to oxygen? And when you get out to the tissues and the oxygen concentration is lower, do you still want it holding on to oxygen? No. Get down to the tissue concentration of about 27 or so, and you see that hemoglobin is only holding on to about 50% of its oxygen. An oxygen-carrying protein, you want to have the ability to bind oxygen when the concentration is high and the ability to let go when the oxygen concentration is low. Hemoglobin meets that qualification perfectly. Myoglobin doesn't do that. Myoglobin only gives up its oxygen when the oxygen concentration is really low. Okay. And that's really good when the oxygen concentration is really low, but it's not really good under normal conditions. So myoglobin isn't used to transport oxygen. Myoglobin is used to store oxygen in your muscles. When your muscle oxygen concentration gets very low, myoglobin gives it up. Myoglobin has uh, a curve that we call hyperbolic. The shape of the curve, curve is hyperbolic. The shape of the curve of hemoglobin 
is sigmoidal. It has an S-like shape. We see that hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen changes as the oxygen concentration changes. As the oxygen concentration gets higher, the affinity gets higher. As the oxygen concentration gets lower, the affinity gets lower. Okay? There's the affinity of, or there's the binding of oxygen by myoglobin at low concentration. Compare that to the same concentration of oxygen, how much hemoglobin has bound? Essentially none. Okay? At high concentrations, both are 100%. There's the sigmoidal, and there's the hyperbolic. OK. Now, this illustrates something that we'll kind of come back to a couple of times. And that is, as I do these plots, a curve that's further to the right has less affinity for oxygen at the same concentration. So we see that hemoglobin has less affinity for oxygen at the same concentration until we get to the very highest concentrations of oxygen. Yes? So on the previous slide, you said that hemoglobin is going to bind to the B chain. Yes. Chain. Yes. Is there any way on the chart like you can say, OK, at this exact point, is this transition from C to R? This is a very good question. It's an excellent question. His question is, can I point out on this graph where this transition from T to R occurs? I will do that, as people commonly do, but I will also point out that this is the sum of all of the things in the, all of the hemoglobin molecules in the mixture. So it's hard to say for any given one. But on average, the T state will be found at the very lowest left part. That transition going up is where the T to R transition is occurring, and the flat state is where all R state will exist. Very, very good question. OK. Well, hemoglobin's pretty cool. It has varying affinity for oxygen, depending upon the oxygen concentration, and that satisfies the needs of the body. But that's not all. Hemoglobin also has affinity that changes as a function of pH. This is known as the Bohr effect, or it's part of the Bohr effect. OK? The Bohr effect says that when you lower the pH from physiological to slightly lower pHs, hemoglobin loses affinity for oxygen. And that's shown in this graph that you see here. Same plot as before, fractional o oxygen uh, saturation going up. What percent is saturated with oxygen? And the pressure of oxygen on the x-axis below. If we start at the far left, we see a red line, or a maroon line, I guess that is, pH 7.6, slightly above physiological pH. Next curve, the brown one, pH 7.4, 7.2, 7.0. We see that these different pH conditions change what percentage of the hemoglobin is bound to oxygen. All right. As we move further to the right, it means more oxygen is required to have the same uh, fraction bound. Well, what does this mean? Well, what this means is something we'll talk about later in metabolism, but I'm going to clue you in on it right now. Rapidly metabolizing cells generate protons. One of the signs that a cell is rapidly doing things, a muscle cell is rapidly doing things, is it will generate protons. What effect do protons have on pH? Reduce it, right? Rapidly metabolizing tissues will have a reduced pH around them. And rapidly metabolizing tissues require more oxygen. So what the rapidly metabolizing cells are doing is they're saying, hey, over here, over here, I'm working, I'm working, give me some oxygen. And the signal is a bunch of protons that it's letting go. And hemoglobin says, oh, I hear something going on here. I bind to proton, and yes, hemoglobin binds to protons. And those protons change the shape of hemoglobin. And the change in the shape of hemoglobin favors release of oxygen. Notice on the last graph I showed you, we lost about 50% just under normal cellular conditions. We still have 50% of our oxygen to give up. 
there's room for hemoglobin to give up more. And these rapidly metabolizing tissues are really needing oxygen, and hemoglobin sensed it. Oxygen was released as a result of that. This is, as I said, the Bohr effect. Okay? More affinity on the left, less affinity on the right. We have changed hemoglobin from having a higher affinity to having a lower affinity. So, protons can bind to hemoglobin. Protons can change hemoglobin's shape. The reshaped hemoglobin, and these, change, these shape changes are very microscopic, very, very tiny. We're not talking about denaturing the protein. We're talking about very slight shape changes. Rapidly, rapidly metabolizing tissues release protons. Rapidly metabolizing tissues get more hemoglobin, they get more oxygen from hemoglobin than those that aren't rapidly metabolizing. Very cool setup. Okay? Well, that's not all there is to the Bohr effect. Okay? There's even more. Rapidly metabolizing tissues also release carbon dioxide. That's a product of the oxidation that they're going through. And it turns out that carbon dioxide also affects hemoglobin. And carbon dioxide also binds to hemoglobin. And carbon dioxide also slightly changes the structure of hemoglobin. And carbon dioxide also favors the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. This is shown in the, pic in the plots that you see here. The blue line on the left, pH 7.4, no carbon dioxide. If we change the pH simply to 7.2, still have no carbon dioxide, we see that the curve shifts to the right, meaning release of some oxygen, less affinity. However, if we take it at 7.2 and we add carbon dioxide, we see it shifts even further to the right. We have the green line that's shown there. Meaning, carbon dioxide and protons both favor the release of oxygen from hemoglobin, and the cell's needs are being met. Did somebody have a question? Do you have a question here? Was that a question? Does CO2 decrease the pH? CO2 by itself does not, but as we will see, CO2 is made into carbonic acid, which does. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. Acid favors the release of oxygen. Carbon dioxide favors the release of oxygen. Acid and carbon dioxide are released by rapidly metabolizing tissues. Rapidly metabolizing tissues get the oxygen that they need. But that's not all. There's more. There's even more. This molecule you see on the screen is a really amazing molecule, and most people I've talked to have never heard about it. 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, more commonly called 2,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG is another product of rapidly metabolizing cells. We'll see why, when we talk about glycolysis, why it's produced by rapidly metabolizing cells. And it's not produced very much by non-rapidly metabolizing cells. 2,3-BPG is also an indicator that a cell is really working hard. Okay? It's a byproduct of glycolysis, as I said. And a cell, like a muscle cell that's doing work, is rapidly going through glycolysis because that's how one, the primary way that cells start generating energy is through by breaking down sugars in glycolysis. The more, rapidly the more rapidly they're metabolizing, the more 2,3-BPG they, they will produce. Exercising cells are producing all three of these things, protons, carbon dioxide, and 2,3-BPG. Now, 2,3-BPG binds in the hole of the donut, in the hole of the donut that I showed you earlier. And the effect that 2,3-BPG has is it locks hemoglobin in the T state. Remember I said the T state was the state where the hemoglobin wants to let go of all of its oxygen. We're squeezing every drop of oxygen that we can out of hemoglobin. 2,3-BPG is now bound. And more importantly, 2,3-BPG is locking hemoglobin in the T state. We've gone from an R state now to complete T state. Hemoglobin has lost all of its oxygen. It's bound to 2,3-BPG. If it goes back to the lungs and it's still bound to 2,3-BPG, 
that hemoglobin is not going to bind hardly any oxygen. What happens then? If it's bound, what happens? Well, binding of molecules to proteins are usually not covalent, and this is not a covalent interaction. This is simply a binding. And when things bind, they bind, they come off, they come on, they come off, they come on. They go back and forth, binding and not binding. As hemoglobin is making its way back to the lungs after having delivered its oxygen and bound to 2,3-BPG, if it did, it didn't have to, but if it did, it comes on, it comes off, it comes on, it comes off. And when it comes off, sometimes a cell grabs that 2,3-BPG and says, hey, I can use that for energy myself. And hemoglobin has lost its 2,3-BPG. So on the way back to the lungs, hemoglobin loses 2,3-BPG, which is really good. Because if it didn't, it was going to be left locked in the T state. Hemoglobin gets back to the lungs. It's in the T state. It has no oxygen, just like I showed you to start. Oxygen forces itself on, and we go back through this whole process. That's really great. Really great. It's really simple how this all works. Okay? We can see this happening on this graph here. We have slow metabolic rate going on the left. We have higher pH in a slow metabolic rate. We have a lower amount of 2,3-BPG at a slower metabolic rate, and we have a lower amount of CO2. That's where hemoglobin is going to have the most affinity. It's farthest to the left. Yes? So how does 2,3-BPG begin to, to, to dissociate? It's doing it constantly. So as I said, it's not covalently bound. So something that doesn't covalently bind can come on, come off, come on, come off. And it's doing that from the minute it binds to hemoglobin. OK? Yes, question? A cellular process that might require the use of 2,3-BPG? Well, I'll talk about that when I talk about metabolism. For now, I just want you to understand it's a molecule that is produced as a byproduct of metabolism of gly uh, in glycolysis, and it can be used in glycolysis by other cells. But we'll talk about that when we talk about metabolism. So for right now, just, just trust me on that. OK? Hopefully you trust me. OK, so slow metabolic rate we see on the left. Increasing metabolic rate decreases pH, increases 2,3-BPG increases carbon dioxide, we see shift to the right, like we've seen for all the things I've talked about so far. Hemoglobin is set up very well to respond to rapid metabolism and deliver oxygen as appropriate for rapid metabolism. Rapidly metabolizing cells produce acid, as we said. They release carbon dioxide. They release 2,3-BPG. There's three things. All of these favor the release of oxygen. And that's important for rapidly metabolizing cells. Now there's a problem. 2,3-BPG is abundant, more abundant in this blood of smokers than it is in non-smokers. That's bad. What happens? Imagine this hemoglobin lets go of 2,3-BPG. It comes on, it comes off, it comes on, it comes off. And I said on the way back to the lungs, it comes off. And sometimes it gets grabbed by a cell, and hemoglobin makes it back to the lungs without the 2,3-BPG. If the blood concentration of 2,3-BPG is higher, it's going to be more likely that it's going to make, the hemoglobin's going to make it back to the lungs with 2,3-BPG on it. That is why smokers get out of breath when they exercise. They have a higher percentage of their hemoglobin that's bound to 2,3-BPG when hemoglobin is making that important transit through the lungs. That is one of the best reasons you can give for not smoking, and there are many. But the reason that smokers have reduced oxygen carrying capacity is because their blood is full of 2,3-BPG. The next question is, well, why is their blood full of 2,3-BPG? It's a good question. And we'll talk about that again when we talk about metabolism. When I talk about glycolysis, you'll go, oh my god, now I know why. Yeah? So blood cells going back to the lungs are going to be in the T state, so something can be bound to it. So if 2,3-BPG is in the T state, yep. how does it differ from a proton or a CO2? Okay, so good question here. 
I said 2,3-BPG is, is locking it in the T state. How is that different from a proton or CO2? Protons and CO2 are not really doing R state, T state things. They're just favoring slight shape changes. They're not locking it into one state or the other. The problem with 2,3-BPG is when it's bound, it is locked in that state. And that's not the case with protons and carbon dioxide. V very good question. OK. So oxygen carrying capacity is reduced. And here's another problem with smoking. Carbon monoxide is higher in the bloodstream of smokers because cigarette smoke has carbon monoxide in it. And here's another bad piece of news. Carbon monoxide binds at the same place that oxygen binds on hemoglobin. Exact same place. They compete for the same binding site. A smoker has reduced oxygen carrying capacity because their 2,3-BPG is higher, and also because many of their hemoglobins are bound to carbon monoxide, and oxygen can't bind. Two things are getting smokers with respect to oxygen carrying capacity. 2,3-BPG, locking hemoglobin in the T-state, carbon monoxide competing with oxygen for binding. Okay. Question. Yeah. Why does carbon monoxide outcompete O2? It doesn't outcompete it necessarily, and I'll, and I'll show you something briefly in a bit about that. But the fact that it competes at all means that you're going to have less oxygen carrying capacity, right? If you run for office unopposed, you're going to win the election, right? But if you run for office and someone's running against you, you're not going to get all the votes. Same thing. Competition here means that you are not going to have the same oxygen carrying uh, if, if it's, uh, uh, there's something competing with it. OK, here's carbon dioxide. Yes, question. So the 2,3-BPG, when it's bound to the hemoglobin, does get released. It's coming that on and off, as I said. Okay? And it, one of the times on it's off, it gets grabbed by a cell. Okay? Remember that non-covalent bindings literally are that way I described to you. That's true for anything that's non-covalently bound. It's not permanently attached. Two questions, one over here. Yeah. Nicotine does not take the place of oxygen. Nicotine has, is a whole different equation, so I, I won't talk about nicotine here. So there are many things. If you want to talk about that, come, come see me. I'll be happy to tell you more. But nicotine is a completely different equation. It has nothing to do with hemoglobin whatsoever. Okay. Can the CO2 be released in the same way that the O2 would? Um, actually, that's what this figure is going to show you. And the answer is we think of it. I, I like to think of it that way. It's, it's CO2, I should point out. Carbon dioxide is not bound where the oxygen is bound. It's bound at a different place on the hemoglobin. It's bound at a different place. And it's bound on the side chain of a histidine. There are many histidines in hemoglobin. Okay, So those histidines provide binding sites for carbon dioxide. Those histidines also provide binding sites for protons. It's the other histidines in hemoglobin that are helping to carry those protons and those carbon dioxides back to the lungs. And they get released fairly readily back in the lungs. So it's not the problem that we have with 2,3-BPG. But they are bound by histidines. Carbon monoxide is bound by the iron. So carbon monoxide is bound differently than carbon dioxide is. Does that answer your question? OK. Well, let's look at what happens to a CO2 molecule released by a rapidly metabolizing cell. There's really two fates it has. One, it can get put into the bloodstream. Okay. And when it goes into the bloodstream, it binds to heme in hemoglobin and forms a complex like what you see here. That's some of it. The remainder gets dissolved in the aqueous part of the blood. The water of the blood dissolves it. There's an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that catalyzes the reaction you see here. H2O plus carbon dioxide gives carbonic acid. 
And that's carbonic acid, shown in the middle of the slide. Carbonic acid is an acid and readily releases protons. Oh, wow, now I know why the pH drops around rapidly metabolizing cells. Carbon dioxide got released. That was the question somebody had over here earlier. Carbon dioxide by itself doesn't release protons, but making carbonic acid does. So rapidly metabolizing cells are releasing carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is making carbonic acid. Carbonic acid releases protons, and those rapidly metabolizing cells see a pH drop. When that molecule makes it back to the lungs of hemoglobin carrying the carbon dioxide, oxygen, as I said, forces itself on. We can see that happening, moving towards the right. We see oxygen coming into play. That oxygen has a blue molecule. We see the blue indicating what's happening in the lungs. <coughs> that hemoglobin that had carbon dioxide lets go of its carbon dioxide and binds to oxygen. So we have just taken, hemo we've just taken carbon dioxide from rapidly metabolizing tissues, put it onto hemoglobin, brought it to the lungs, dumped it in the lungs, and carbon dioxide will be exhaled. Okay? We've completed a cycle. Hemoglobin now is oxygenated again. It's happening in the lungs, and it's going to go out and do the same process all over again. Meanwhile, in the lungs, carbon dioxide has been released, and carbon dioxide is exhaled. This is the Bohr effect. These are all the things I talked about with respect to the Bohr effect. The Bohr effect does not include 2,3-BPG, but it includes all the other things that you see here. Somebody asked about binding of carbon monoxide. This shows that heme center, and we see the binding of oxygen occurring at that heme center. It turns out that there's not only a histidine below the iron, there's also one above. It's just not physically attached to it. And that one above helps to block things out. It actually reduces the affinity of the hemoglobin for carbon monoxide. It doesn't eliminate it, but it does favor oxygen a little bit more than it favors carbon monoxide. That's important. Okay? There's that same structure bound to carbon monoxide. And if you look at that, you see carbon monoxide has pretty much the same shape that oxygen does. And that's why it's able to bind in the same place that oxygen does. OK. How much time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes. Should we sing? Yeah. OK, he's been talking too much. Uh, let's see. Great, what proteins can do, especially ones that bind to O2. Hemoglobin's moving around. Inside of the lungs, it picks up the bait, changes itself from T to R state. Hemoglobin's moving around. The protoporphyrin system, its iron makes such a scene. A rising wind at O2 binds, pulling up on histidine. The binding occurs cooperatively, thanks to changes quaternary. Hemoglobin's moving around. It exits the lungs, engorged with O2, search of a burking body tissue. Hemoglobin's moving around. Proton concentration is high and has a role. Between the alpha betas, it binds a midazole. That's histidine. Do, 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 to empty their loads, the globins decree. We need to bind to 3-BPG. Hemoglobin's moving around. 
the stage is thus set for grabbing a few cellular dumps of CO2. Hemoglobin's moving around. And then inside the lungs it discovers oxygen and dumps the CO2 off. Start all over again. See how this works? You better expect to have to describe the Bohr effect. Hemoglobin's moving around. All right, guys.